Thank you, Mary Sabrin, for being here. This is the uh, Libertarian candidate for the 2018 center election. Um, is that not true? It's absolutely true. Uh, March 24th, I received the nomination at the convention and that was held at Rutgers University. And uh, uh, we've been campaigning ever since. The first part of the campaign is to get enough signatures to get on the ballot, which we did. We needed 800 signatures. We had nearly 1,600 signatures submitted. And uh, we uh, are on the ballot with the other major candidates and some of the other independent candidates that are running. But uh, we have a full-fledged campaign of volunteers. We have no paid staff. These are people who are committed to the principles of uh, less government, uh, more peace, more prosperity, protecting civil liberties. All the things that I think most Americans believe in, but yet uh, they don't vote that way. They vote for Democrats and Republicans historically, who have taken away a lot of their rights, who have given us a lot of taxation, who have spent money that, that they don't raise through taxes. That's why we have to borrow so much money. The national debt is $21 trillion which has been accumulated under both Republicans and Democrats. We have a $4 trillion budget, which has risen because of Republicans and Democrats' desire to spend more money to win votes in every election. We have a huge military-industrial complex, which is spending, according to some people, a trillion dollars a year. We have bases all over the world. That doesn't protect the American people. It's basically an example of overreaching to try to do what uh, Woodrow Wilson said, uh, a hundred years ago to make the world safe for democracy. It hasn't worked out too well. We've intervened uh, constantly since the end of World War II in Korea, Vietnam, Central America, and now the Middle East. So we're involved all over the world, and it's not in the best interest of the American people. It's certainly not in the best interest of foreign people, or I should say people overseas, who get bombed. Uh, a lot of people have been dying needlessly in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other parts of uh, the Middle East uh, because of our interventionist foreign policy. So we should have the foreign policy that George Washington laid down in his uh, farewell address. We should have commerce with all and no entangling alliances. And that would reduce military spending by tens and tens of billions of dollars. And we would have, I think, a much stronger economy. We would have a much stronger presence in the world of uh, peaceful relations around the world instead of trying to, um, trying to sort out all the problems in the Mideast and other parts of the world. So I believe that we have to go back to first principles that founded this country. And if we did that, uh, if Republicans and Democrats had done that, there'd be no need for me to run for the U.S. Senate because I want to make substantial changes that will improve the lives of all the American people except the people who want to use the government for their own self-interest. And that's the problem. We have a lot of crony capitalism in America, enormous amount of crony capitalism. The best example of that was Solyndra the uh, solar company that received huge subsidies and they went bankrupt. The government cannot force feed an industry or a company. Let the marketplace do it. It's called supply and demand. It's economics 101 and it's finance 101. Let the marketplace do it, which means people deciding what their values and preferences are and entrepreneurs which, who are trained to meet people's needs will be able to do so and that's what a free market economy is all about. That's what the free enterprise system is all about. The free enterprise system has been the greatest engine for economic growth and raising living standards in the last hundred years. And so what do you have people calling for? Socialism, which has been a failure all over the world. It's amazing. It is really such a disconnect between reality and philosophy. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable. I'm old enough to see, uh, have seen how this has shifted, not only in the United States, but around the world. Uh, but interestingly enough, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the liberation of East Europe, we've seen more markets, especially in China, uh, emerge because people realize around the world that have to have a higher standard of living, you have to have markets. And look at the contrast between South Korea and North Korea, between communist North Korea and um, relatively free market South Korea. It's the, the difference is, is, is so stark that there's a great... Um, uh, satellite view you can see on Google at night, there are virtually few lights in North Korea and South Korea is all lit up because they have the ability in the South to use principles of economics and finance that deliver the goods to the people. And that's not what communism does or even socialism does. So my candidacy is very simple. If you want the status quo, vote for one of the two major party candidates. They, they both believe the same thing. Spend, tax, regulate, borrow, print money. That's what Republicans and Democrats have supported for the last hundred years. I'm offering an alternative to 
the treadmill that we've been on, which is free up the economy, adhere to the Constitution, stop the Federal Reserve from manipulating interest rates, which has given us the boom-bust cycle, and uh, deregulate the economy so we could have a stronger economy. Deregulation doesn't mean business can do anything. Businesses still have to, have to adhere to the rule of law. You can't commit fraud, you can't uh, pollute, you can't do all the things that people say they're against, which of course they should be against. And so what I'm proposing is that if we have a society based upon private property and a strong legal system, we would solve virtually all our problems here in the United States. Okay. So, you, as you said when we were talking earlier, you are a professor of finance? Yes. Um, how do you think, think a professor of finance would handle to people who've had experience in the Senate like Menendez or um, people who have had ex other political experiences? Well, it's very simple. Uh, I've been talking about these issues, like I said, since the 1970s. I've written about uh, the economy. I've written about the Federal Reserve. I've written about foreign policy. I've written about deregulation. I've given speeches. I I've, I've, uh, wrote a book. I uh, uh, wrote essays in a collection of books. So I have the experience based upon my understanding of how an economy works, what doesn't work, what does work, and how we can improve the people's lives through using common sense approaches, which is what? Markets. Markets are the way people get together voluntarily, peacefully to achieve their goals. Who doesn't want to achieve their goals in a peaceful manner? I don't know anybody like that. So the question is, why do, does someone want to go to the United States Senate? You're only one of a hundred people, but you do have what, what is important. You have a big microphone like this. You can get into the Senate, you can make a speech, it's heard all over the country through C-SPAN, the nightly news will carry it, and then you go on the Sunday talk shows and make the case, like Bernie Sanders did when he ran for president, Donald Trump did, and you make the case to the American people, here's the problems, here's how it, they came about, and here are the solutions to the problems. Without talking about ideology or uh, politics, you talk about common sense approaches. I mean, if you go to a doctor, you want the doctor to give you a common sense diagnosis and a common sense prescription for what ails you, as opposed to getting to the whole philosophy of uh, the nervous system and all that stuff. You want someone to, to explain to you what are the problems that you're facing and how do you fix them. Well, the same thing with the economy. The economy can work on its own if it's left alone by the politicians. And there's not only historical evidence, but there's also theoretical evidence. Well, when the government intervenes, what tends to happen is the consequences are counterproductive than the goals that the politicians set out to achieve. A good example would be the minimum wage. Most people think, uh, I think there's a substantial support for minimum, hiking the minimum wage, but what that does is raise the cost of labor of the most unskilled people in society, and that does what? Makes them unemployed. Because if you raise the price of something, there's going to be what? Lower demand for it. So it's a simple concept of supply and demand. Let, if you don't believe me, let's raise the minimum wage to $100 an hour. Let's see what happens. There'll be massive unemployment in this country. Or the other uh, possibility would be the Federal Reserve would create so much money in order for uh, employers to pay that $100 an hour, we'd have massive inflation. So although it sounds good on paper, raising the wages by law is counterproductive. And that's what people need to realize, that all these things that have good intentions, if you have the same goal of raising the wages of people, the best way to do it is for people to have what? More skills, more productive skills. But if you have very low skills, you're not going to earn a lot of money in our economy. It's people who have a lot of skills, whether it's in sports or entertainment or any field like that, or in uh, high tech or um, uh, uh, medicine. I mean, brilliant docs get paid a lot more than your average average physician. So again, the marketplace determines wages, but employees don't determine wages. It's the marketplace. Look at, look at sports where people are making 20, 30 million dollars a year. Not because the, the, uh, the uh, sports owners are benevolent, it's because the people who are making that money bring in the fans to the, to the sports arena, which allow them to what, fill the seats and uh, generate the revenue to pay the, the athletes that type of money. Same thing with movie stars. Why does someone make $20 million a year, uh, $20 million per movie, as opposed to someone that makes $2 million per movie? Because those films generate a lot of revenue. I tell my students, if I could fill up 
MetLife Stadium with my lectures of 80,000 people. I'd make a lot of money as a professor, but I, I teach small classes, so you make a, a, a modest income relative to what sports people do. But that's okay, because I'm content in doing what I do, and I think I do it fairly well. And so therefore, uh, we have to realize that uh, the economy is not an arbitrary construct of uh, capitalist, which is what people on the left would say. A, a market economy is based upon supply and demand. It's that simple. I mean, Adam Smith laid it out more than 200 years ago. People before him laid it out in, in Europe uh, as well. And so um, when I hear people talk about the economy in terms of let's pass a law to achieve an objective, that's not our economy is going to be thriving in the future. And we see this in the United States. There have been so many laws passed on the economy. Uh, although the economy looks good, it's still in a bubble. We still have a bubble. And the question is, when is it going to pop? And nobody knows that answer. You mentioned you were uh, born in Germany. Yes. Um, you immigrated here. Um, I know a hot button issue currently is immigration. What is your stance on immigration? Well, very simple. Uh, my parents, um, my father wrote his first cousin who preceded us to America in 1946. We came here in 1949. He wrote his great aunt in New York City and uh, we got the papers that we needed. I don't know exactly what they were, but they did it legally. My father was interviewed extensively, he told me, um, in Germany to come to America to make sure that he was not a subversive, because remember, this is right after World War II, the communists had taken over Eastern Europe. He had, uh, my parents uh, emigrated from Poland, where they were uh, during the war in 1946 to Germany. So the American officials in Germany wanted to know what was his background, and of course, his background was pretty impressive. He was a partisan commander during World War II for a year uh, in Poland to defeat the Nazis, and they were liberated in July of 1944. So the process that my parents took is a rational, common sense approach to immigration. You want to come to America, you apply overseas at the American Embassy or Council, you get sponsorship by people in America who are responsible for your well-being until you become, what, financially independent, and that would avoid all the illegal immigration. Now, still people are going to come, I think, without that process in place, because if we have something like that, I think, right now, I haven't gone through the details of what our immigration policy is, but the question is, why are people coming here? Obviously, they want a better life than where they are in Africa, South America, Central America, because there are a lot of problems in countries overseas. So we need to have a rational approach, common sense approach, a humane approach, which is what my parents followed. And I think we would solve a lot of the problems. But the question is, what about the people who came here already who didn't follow the process? And that becomes really more problematic. So I'm open to all suggestions. And I think one that would be very interesting that I've heard is uh, people who are here, since they jumped ahead of the line, which is a no-no, right? We don't want people jumping ahead of the line no matter where, where we are, whether it's in the movie theater or the restaurant. If you're online, you wait your turn. So when, when it comes to immigration, if you jump the line and you're here, I think a case could be made that you forfeited your right to become a citizen and you become, quote, um, a permanent resident. And you don't have the right to vote. You do everything that is, uh, you, a citizen who has uh, followed the rules uh, does, namely citizenship, voting, but uh, if you've built a life here for the last 10, 20, 30 years, so be it. I mean, uh, I think it's a little inhumane and uh, counterproductive to try to round up everybody that's come here illegally and uh, ship them out of the country. I don't think that makes much sense. I don't think we have the resources to do it, but if you commit a crime and you're not here illegally, you should be deported. I think that's pretty clear. Okay. I don't think uh, you should be put in our prisons at the cost of taxpayers when you come here illegally. I think you should be deported to your home country. Okay. So New Jersey has one of, if not the worst, um, uh, heroin epidemic yeah. in the entire country. Yeah. What would be your position on fixing that? Well, this is a medical problem. It's not a, a legal problem. It's a medical problem. And uh, I've been on record saying the reason that we have that, that prohibition causes is causes the supply to increase because a product is now being sold at extraordinary prices because of what uh, because of prohibition we had this during during alcohol prohibition in the 1920s but having said that the last thing we want to do is put people who have drug abuse in jail portugal has decriminalized 
everything, and it seems to be working fine because people are being now treated. Uh, whether the government should treat it or not is a separate issue. But the point is, these are medical issues. We don't people put in, we don't put people in jail because they have an alcohol problem. We don't people put in jail because they're a chain smoker. We don't put people in jail because they uh, have food addictions. So if someone has a drug addiction, they should be treated like anyone else who has a medical problem through what the healthcare system. And uh, unfortunately, from what I've heard and read, is that the government has helped create a lot of these problems because of the government regulation of healthcare. Because uh, people who go to uh, hospitals, uh, emergency rooms, um, they are given painkillers instead of being treated for their ailment because there are some rules and regulations that if you keep them overnight or, or more than two nights, uh, there's some extraordinary paperwork involved and costs involved. So it's easy for hospitals to give people painkillers to address their illnesses rather, rather than treat their, their problems. So that's an issue that we need to address is how does government, or how do government regulations impact the use or overuse of opioids to treat pain in the country? So I think that's something that we need to address. Um, are you in support of legalizing cannabis for New Jersey? Oh yeah, I mean, I've been on record a long time. I mean, uh, I grew up watching The Untouchables about uh, Al Capone and Prohibition back in the 50s and 60s. So uh, when I was a little kid, I didn't make any sense to have Prohibition. So again, what we want to do at, at the federal level, uh, Senator Booker is involved with this, with Senator uh, Rand Paul from uh, Kentucky, is to uh, 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 eliminate the prohibition of marijuana at the federal level. And then it'll be up to the states. So from a constitutional perspective, that makes sense because the 10th Amendment would give the states the right to address this issue. There's nothing in our U.S. Constitution that talks about prohibition of any product. In fact, the reason alcohol was banned is we went through the constitutional process, the 18th Amendment, because back then they respected the Constitution and realized that you cannot ban a substance federally because there was no legal authority to do so from the Constitution or constitutional authority to do so. So they went through the constitutional amendment process and used that amend the Constitution to give the federal government the authority to ban alcohol. So since we live, I think, in a post-constitutional America, uh, they've been banning marijuana and other substances that the government thinks is um, uh, uh, something that should not be used by the people. But from everything I read, uh, marijuana has a lot of uh, medicinal uh, uh, benefits and people should be able to go to their physician or their naturopath a healthcare professional and say, what's the best treatment for me? Because everyone is different regarding tolerances for medication and so on and so forth, food and, and, and things like that. So we should have the doctor-patient relationship at the center of the healthcare uh, process as opposed to the government mandating this to, to doctors and uh, patients and hospitals and insurance companies. And one of the reasons I'm concerned about the healthcare system is that I can see over the next 50 years is that we go to a single-payer system where the doctor-patient relationship will basically be set aside for the relationship or the power of the government, hospitals and insurance companies, and big pharma. I think that's the danger of a single-payer healthcare system, is that we take the decision-making out of the hands of the doctor and the patient which is supposed to be the most important um, healthcare relationship in our society, and I've seen it in my lifetime, that relationship is now being whittled away as doctors are now becoming less independent practitioners and more part of the, what people have called the health industrial complex. So would you try to create or pass any laws that regulated um, doctors from possibly giving too many, um, too much of a pills that are addictive substances? Uh, that, that's, that's, this, this is why health care is too important to be left to the government. People have said war is too important to be left to the generals, health care is too important to be left to bureaucrats and politicians. I mean, most, most uh, politicians are not physicians, they're not health care professionals. Let the health care professionals do what they do best. And of course, people make mistakes. There are mistakes made at every profession, at every level. So we don't live in a perfect society. We're never going to create a perfect society. We're going to create a society to give people choices and freedom. And, account and we have to have accountability. And so that's the type of world I want to live in, as opposed to 
worrying about the mandates coming out of Washington, D.C. or even Trump. Okay. Um, so libertarians are very big on the Second Amendment, having the right to bear arms and all that. Um, so I'm not going to ask you your position on that, because mm -hmm. clearly you are. Um, but in the wake of all the horrid mass shootings, yeah. um, would you do anything to regulate um, having people bear arms, having any AR, the AR-15? I know people were trying to uh, ban and bump stocks and what have you. This, this is another example of putting the cart before the horse. We don't know who's going to be a criminal before a criminal act occurs. Um, that's why they got rid of stop and frisk in New York City, because they thought that was, that would be the method to get, what, prevent crime. And so they stopped stop and frisk, and guess what? Crime, I don't I think, has increased in New York City because of that. But when it comes to uh, the right uh, to bear arms, I take it from the perspective of even if we didn't have the Second Amendment to the Constitution, you still have a right to self-defense. You have a right to defend yourself, your family, and your property. In fact, the UN Declaration of Human Rights says that in Article 3, that everyone has the, in the world has the right to security of person. But well, what does that mean? It means the right to protect yourself and your property. So uh, a firearm is an inanimate object. In other words, if there was a firearm right here, nothing bad would happen unless somebody has, what, bad intent of using that to hurt somebody. So what I find fascinating is why people are demonizing inanimate objects. I mean, there are people... Have, there are knife attacks all over this country. People don't talk about knife crime, they talk about uh, crime. But when they talk, about, they talk about gun crime, well, guns don't commit crime, firearms don't commit crime, human beings commit crime. See, this is where people take, they think they're taking the high road by saying firearms or guns commit crime. No, they don't. Human beings commit crime. See, we're, de we're dehumanizing a lot of things in our society, and I think that that takes us down a road that I think is to authoritarianism, that we take the human equation out of all the decisions that take place in society. So when someone drives to a stop sign, we don't talk about vehicle crime or vehicle uh, uh, behavior. We talk about the person who went through the stop sign and may kill somebody in the intersection. So the same thing with firearms. I mean, firearms are, are not the problem. The problem is there are a lot of people, from what I read, who, especially young people, who are under uh, prescription drugs, taking a lot of these drugs, that we know some of the consequences are, what, depression and aggressive behavior. So let's have the experts look at that. What's the relationship between young people, uh, th these drugs that they're taking for uh, depression and other anxiety issues, and what's the relationship between that and uh, acting out in a very violent manner? I mean, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a healthcare professional, let them present to the legislature what the problems are. But the point is, we have laws in place, especially in New Jersey, that are very draconian. In fact, a case could be made that New Jersey gun laws violate the Second Amendment. Because in New Jersey, the only place you can have a firearm legally is in your residence or on a firing range. And when you go to a firing range, you, could, you have to put your firearm and your cartridges separately in the trunk of your car that's locked, and you cannot deviate from your home to the firing range. You have to go to the straight line. So let's say you want to go to a, a restaurant after you go to a firing range. You can't do that. So I, I don't see the, 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 the uh, common sense about that. I mean, people have the right to go to a restaurant after they go to the firing range. So there's a case to be made that states that violate people's constitutional rights uh, should be subject to very great scrutiny. And I would, as a U.S. Senator, look at all these laws that uh, states have that are not consistent with the U.S. Constitution, which is what the Supreme Law of the Land. So I think that's the issue that we need to address is um, uh, inanimate objects don't cause problems. Automobiles don't cause problems. It's someone behind the wheel who's drunk that causes the problem. So saying mental health is the um, kind of like the root cause of the problem. Or people have just mal uh, uh, are just are criminals. I mean, I'm not a criminologist. Let's find out the root cause of crimes. There are many factors of root causes root cause of crime. Um, and to say we're going to use the law to prevent crime, no. The law is, to, is used to punish crime. Uh, what we have to have in our society is parents transmitting good values to kids. That's the way I grew up as a youngster. My parents transmitted good values 
to my brothers and me. So that's what we need. We need strong families. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that the, um, that the best anti-poverty program, the best cultural uh, system that we have is a two-parent family. I've seen evidence of that in research that if parents are well-educated um, and they have higher incomes, kids are going to do much better in life, which makes a lot of sense. But if you come from a single parent family with very low income, you don't have many opportunities in life. So I think we have to figure out how to strengthen families. And I don't think the answer is in government, but the answer is in communities and, and uh, uh, institutions that will strengthen family life in, in America. Okay. Um, so another hot button issue that has been resurfacing recently is um, abortion. Mm -hmm. um, as a libertarian, do you believe that a woman should have the right to have an abortion? Let me give you my personal uh, journey, if you will, on this issue. Growing up in New York City in the 1960s, um, uh, as a youngster in high school and college, I was pro-choice. Uh, New York State passed up. Um, uh, overturned its abortion laws, I think in 1970, 71, before Roe v. Wade. However, when Roe v. Wade was um, announced, I was opposed to it, even though I was pro-choice at the time, because there's nothing in the Constitution that says the federal government has any responsibility on the abortion issue. And so it seemed to me that that was a violation of the Tenth Amendment, that if it's not articulated in the Constitution explicitly, then it's left to the states to the side. And that's what it was prior to Roe Ro versus Wade. The, federal, the Supreme Court, unfortunately, made this a national issue, as opposed to what the founders envisioned for the country was what the states would be laboratories of democracy, that the culture of each state would be reflected in the laws of that state. Having said that, I was pro-choice until I saw pictures of partial birth abortion in the mid-90s, when one of my students showed me pictures of partial birth abortion. Why she showed it to me, I, I have no idea. This is before I got involved in politics. I said, why is she showing me this? But when I saw pictures of it, I, said, I was horrified that it was legal in this country to essentially destroy a human being just before birth or a month before birth when you have a fully developed baby. And so then when I became the Libertarian Party candidate for governor, that was one of the hot button issues, the partial birth abortion issue, whether it should be banned or not. And my two opponents were in favor of partial birth abortion, which I found bizarre since they're both parents at the time, and still are, obviously. And I was the one taking the position that, from a libertarian perspective, the, the primary principle of libertarianism is what? Non-aggression. And so I saw this very consistent with the libertarian philosophy of non-aggression. Now, libertarians are divided on this issue. I don't know what the exact percentage is, but there are libertarians that are pro-choice, there are libertarians that are pro-life, and... Um, this is a very fascinating discussion. And so, um, and then I read Congressman Ron Paul, a uh, former presidential candidate and congressman, who's an obstetrician, and he sent me his book that he wrote, Challenge to Liberty, which is um, a libertarian defense of the pro-life position from his experience as an obstetrician. And that convinced me that if you're opposed to partial birth abortion at nine months or eight and a half months, then logically you've got to be opposed to abortion at eight months or seven months or six months or until the baby is created at conception. So I think a very um, uh, logical position, I think, that abortion is the destruction of human life. It's couched to what? Choice. Which is a bizarre notion when you think about it because you have Professor Peter Singer from Princeton University who has said, who has written, who has advocated that parents have the right to kill their child up until the age of three. Now, I don't know where that's coming from, but I find that so bizarre that uh, that's over the top. Uh, how anyone can, can go from even a pro-choice position to killing your child up to the age of three makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, it's it just uh, a, a way of thinking that I can't comprehend as a human being. How can you advocate the killing of a human being? And so this is why this is such a contentious issues because I think people are not looking at this from the perspective of there are two parties involved, the woman and the unborn child. So the question is, does the unborn child have legal protection from the time of conception to the time of birth? And I think the answer has to be yes, given my reading and uh, 
uh, discussion with people on, on, on this issue. And so therefore, uh, uh, the new Supreme Court Justice and nominee said that Roe v. Wade is set a law, but um, even if Roe v. Wade would, would be overturned, uh, which I don't think is going to happen, but if it would be, then it would be up to the states, like it was prior to 73. And states that wanted abortion uh, legal would do it, and states that didn't want it would not have it. And so, uh, I remember Bill Clinton famously said, abortion should be legal, safe, and rare. Well, it's not rare anymore. It's uh, still hundreds of thousands of uh, abortions every year. And um, it's unfortunate, I think, because um, uh, given how many abortions were committed, uh, performed since 1973, here's something that people don't want to talk about. How many great scientists never saw the light of day? How many great musicians, artists, writers didn't see the light of day because they were aborted? Well, never know that. And that, to me, is a, an opportunity cost that um, is, is uh, pretty sad for any society that losing potential great people coming into this world. People who could have been geniuses. People who may have, what, cured cancer and would never had the opportunity to be born. So, and this is an economic issue as well. This is about the economic cost of abortion. What are we missing from the, um, from the skills of the people uh, who were aborted? And no one talks about that. So I think we have to raise that as an issue that should be addressed by people, is that there's a cost to every action that you do. There's a cost of us doing this interview. I can't do it. I could have done, and you could, and you have a cost of coming here and interviewing me. So there's a cost of every action that we do, and so we have to talk about real costs when it comes to abortion and other issues. Okay. So you started your political career starting as a libertarian. Yes. And you kind of had like a rough patch where you were Republican a couple times. Yeah. What What happened after the '97 campaign? And I did so well. I got nearly five percent of the vote, and I was polling in double digits a week or two before the election because it was so close. People decided, hey, who do I want least to run? So they voted for the other candidate. Um, and then I was recruited, so to speak, by the Republican Liberty Caucus, which are libertarians within the Republican Party who want to make the Republican Party more libertarian. They encouraged me to uh, seek the Republican nomination for the U.S. Senate in 2000 because Senator Lautenberg was retiring. And um, I um, uh, re-registered as a Republican because I was a Republican in New York City briefly in 1969, 70, 71. And, um, got into the primary against, well, I was campaigning for the, uh, uh, in the primary and Governor Whitman was in the race, but she bowed out and three other Republicans came in and one of them won the primary. And then I tried it again in 2000 and 2014. And I said, uh, the Republican Party is not serious about these issues that I care about. And so, um, uh, earlier this year, I received an invitation to seek the Libertarian nomination for the U.S. Senate this year. And so I, discussed it with my wife and we went over all the pro pros and cons because it's not an easy thing. People think it's glamorous running for a, a statewide office. It's not glamorous. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of time consuming uh, effort uh, where you have to call people up for money. You have to go around the state, which I don't mind because I like to talk about ideas with people. And so um, we, um, we, I decided to run and here we are discussing the great issues of our time. Yeah. Okay, so as a libertarian, I'm sure you have a lot of extensive research on the Federal Reserve and um, foreign immigration. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I first got interested in this back in the late 60s, early 70s, when I, when the economy was going through convulsions um, with the decline of the dollar and uh, President Nixon's uh, 1971, August 1971 uh, executive order delinking the dollar from gold. And so we now are on a paper money uh, uh, standard. And so uh, I got really interested in it, and I wrote a dissertation on inflation, so I researched a lot about monetary policy and how uh, money and prices uh, are uh, spread through the economy. So I wrote that in the 1970s. And of course, we had the two bouts of double-digit inflation in the 1970s because the Federal Reserve was just printing up a lot of money to try to stimulate the economy, which doesn't work. Uh, in, the sh in the long run, in the short run, it does well. It's, it's a sugar high for the economy. That's what the boom-bust cycle is all about, which I wrote about in the New York Times in 1976, how uh, the Federal Reserve's policies will give us constantly this boom and bust cycle. And boy, did we get two booms and busts in the 90s and in the 2000s with the dot-com bubble and the housing bubble. And now we're in what some people have called the everything bubble. Everything's inflated. 
real estate prices, stock prices, bond prices, artwork is inflated when a piece of artwork is going for $100 billion, which is absurd when prices in San Francisco are so absurd people can't afford uh, living there even though they work there and they have to commute two hours each way to find a decent place to live. This is an example of inflating the supply of money in order to stimulate the economy and all it does is drive up asset prices such as real estate and stocks and so on. So uh, we need to have a real good national debate about what monetary policy should be because as long as the Federal Reserve keeps on manipulating interest rates by pumping money in, which they did during the financial crisis of 2008, which generated the stock market boom, we're now in the longest stock market boom in history. And um, I don't know what the, what the uh, we're, we're probably at an all-time high also in the stock market, but as they say, what goes up must come down, as we saw during the dot-com and the housing bubble. So again, I would go there with my knowledge of the Federal Reserve and monetary policy and banking policy, and let's have a real robust debate about uh, what the Federal Reserve does, how it does it, and what's the best course of action going forward. So um, I think I can bring my expertise to the uh, United States Senate and talk about these issues. The incumbent senator has been AWOL on these issues. He's been in Congress for what? Uh, 20 years. I don't think he's ever mentioned uh, monetary policy in any of his uh, speeches or uh, in Congress or on, uh, uh, in New Jersey about the devastating impact of these bubbles on uh, the American people. So uh, I think I could bring something to the Senate that the very few people running for the Senate can do. Uh, virtually a lifetime of research and expertise in, in monetary policy. When it comes to foreign policy, this is the flip side of the coin. We're trying to make the world safe in democracy, and it hasn't worked out. Uh, we didn't win in Korea. We didn't win in uh, Vietnam. Um, we spent, as Trump pointed out correctly during his campaign, $7 trillion in the Mideast. Every dollar has been borrowed. That's why the debt is now $21 trillion. And we're trying to remake Afghanistan, which is not a country. It's really a, 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 a combination of tribal regions that have been put together by the old colonial powers. So what we're trying to do there is mission impossible. Even Tom Cruise couldn't fix Afghanistan, and we're trying to fix it. Uh, it's not going to work. Uh, we spent so much money and lives in um, Iraq, and now we're in Syria, we're in Yemen. Um, th this is not good for the American people. It's not good for uh, peace. It's not good for stability in the region. So again, we need to go back to a common sense foreign policy which is goodwill toward nations, getting rid of sanctions. I'm not in favor of sanctions against any country. I don't think the United States government should punish innocent people overseas because we don't like the leaders of those countries or what we think they're doing to us, like, like hacking, like with the allegation that Russians are hacking us. If it's proven, well, then you go to a court, present the evidence, and you indict people. You don't impose sanctions on a whole country because you think some of the people are uh, hacking us. You have a, a, a process called what indictment and presenting the evidence to a grand jury and uh, try them in absentia. I don't know if that's legal or not under international law, but let's try it and see what happens. But present the evidence. You can't make an allegation and, and assert that it's the truth. So we need to have uh, a process in place to say what are the facts regarding any untoward action toward um, the American people or American businesses or American institutions. Because we just can't blanket say that uh, the Russians did it, or the uh, Chinese did it, or the Koreans did it, or anybody, or the Ukrainians did it, or whoever the case may be. Present evidence in a court of law, and then let the process uh, uh, unfold. Yeah. So, you mentioned Trump, and he's probably one of the most hot button issues oh, yeah. you can really talk about these days. What are your opinions on Trump? Well, it's very simple. If he embraces my campaign uh, agenda, peace, liberty, and prosperity, I'll support whatever legislation he proposes or anybody proposes in the Congress that gets us more peace, that gets us more liberty, that gets us more prosperity by free markets and deregulation and all that. So again, I've lived long enough to see presidents come and go, members of Congress come and go, Supreme Court justices come and go, but not very often because they're there for 30, 40 years. So I'm an issue-oriented person. And I don't care about personalities of people in, in power because uh, that's a sideshow. What's important is, are these laws good for the country? That's all I care about. I don't care about uh, the personalities of people who are there. Uh, they may rub you the wrong way, but I just, um, I can't change people's personalities. 
I can help change the laws. That's why I want to go to the United States Senate. I want to help change the laws that will make life better for the American people as opposed to dealing with somebody's tweets. So that's where I'm coming from in, in this campaign is um, one of the things I'm going to propose, which is going to be uh, out trumping Trump because of his tax uh, proposal last year or this year to lower the corporate tax rate. I want the corporate tax rate to be zero because under our tax code, income should only be taxed once. So if you are a shareholder, your income is taxed twice, once at the corporate level, and then if you get a dividend at the shareholder level. So by getting rid of the corporate income tax, we would have the best economy in the world because capital would come from all over the world to invest in America. That didn't mean that people wouldn't pay taxes, but the, uh, the taxes would be uh, levied at the shareholder level as opposed to the corporate level, so income would only be taxed once. We would have the greatest economy ever in the history of the world by getting rid of the corporate income tax. And that would mean higher wages. That would mean um, greater productivity. It would mean a stronger economy. Uh, and we would be the engine of the world economy. And I think that's something that I'm going to be promoting on the campaign trail. You've heard here from me at first, is that a zero corporate income tax. And I think a lot of business people would like that because it would make their lives a lot easier. Because if the corporate income tax is constantly changing, then how do you plan as an entrepreneur when rates are going to go up, rates are going to go down, you know? And you want to plan for the next five, ten years. And one of the things you want, you want to know is what will your tax liability be? But if we take that out of the equation and the income is taxed at the shareholder level, then we've we eliminate a lot of uncertainty in uh, planning for corporate for, for businesses, not just corporate America, but also for small businesses that are incorporated. Well, I think that's all the questions I have for you. Thank you so much for meeting with me. Thank you, thank you, George. Appreciate it. Okay.